Professor Lufemi Vaughan is on state affairs. Professor Vaughan, in looking at your book, Religion and the Making of Nigeria, I reflect deeply on our journey so far. The question is, where are we coming from? And where are we coming from can also take us to where the Aousa Fulani is coming from. Because it seems the crisis of the Nigerian state is a fault of the Aousa Fulani. If you look at the discourse, can the Sokoto Caliphate or the Usmad and Fudio Jihad, did that jihad play a role that we have not been able to resolve in the present? The, the jihad of Usman Danfodio, what I prefer to refer to as the Islamic reformist movement of uh, Sokoto, of what became the Sokoto Caliphate, as many people know, started in 1804 and transformed the vast and heterogeneous region of what is today's northern Nigeria and much of contemporary Niger. So the transformative impact of this jihad was, quite frankly, significant and monumental. Its reverberations remain very much a part of the structure of contemporary Nigerian state and society. So this historical dimension, at least its practices, ideologies, and structures remain endemic in contemporary Nigerian state and society. Mm -hmm. I should mention that we need to be careful about casting blame on House of Fulani or Kanuri Muslims. Uh, if one is really to cast blame, it's very important for us to hold all our leaders from north to south, east to west, Christians and Muslims, responsible for the Nigerian predicament. This is a crisis of the Nigerian political elite, not just simply a crisis created by one section of the country. What did the jihad do to the structures of the Hausa states? Well, the jihad effectively toppled the age-old traditions of the Hausa city-states. So the Hausa is different from the Fulani. Right. But now there's also that reference to an ifinated Hausa Fulani. Tell me more. Right. So um, the notion... Uh, there's so much reference to Fulani these days, right? But I always tell people all the time that we don't quite know exactly what it is, what we mean by Fulani. Uh, to the degree that many Fulanis are, have intermarried with so many local communities, not just simply Hausa, but also other ethnic groups in central and northern Nigeria. So the question here is not really about blood purity in terms of one's ethnicity, but rather the entire, the basis of patrilineal and patriarchal identification in making claims to land and property and power. But so the, the, no, the notion of ethnicity and Fulani is very much connected to questions and claims of power. I think it's really very important. Who are those making the so, argument? Because from what we can see, Nigerians feel is the ethnic question, mm -hmm. the religious question. Yes. Even an person just talks about Islamization mm -hmm. and Fulanization. Mm -hmm. Are scholars ready to study these terms? Well, I mean, um, I, I, the, the reference by the former president to Fulanization and Islamization, that process, that historical process, is central to the making of northern and central Nigeria in terms of power, prestige, and influence. It's a structural, fundamental question that emanated out of the jihad of Sokoto. So those terms make sense? They do. They do make sense. They do make sense within the context, and this is really very important, they do make sense within the context of contemporary northern and central Nigeria. But I have to, I have reservations about its meaning in southern Nigeria. So it's really very important to draw those kinds of two distinctions. Let me get you clear. Are you saying there is Fulanization going on in Nigeria? There's a process of Islamization and, and Hausa Fulani hegemony 
in northern Nigeria. That came out of the out of the so-called the success of the so-called jihad in the 19th century and was essentially affirmed by British colonialism through the Lugardian system of indirect rule over a period of 50 years from the conquest of Sokoto in 1903 by the British. Remember, the British ruled northern Nigeria, the northern Nigerian protectorate through the indirect rule system. The indirect rule system, the main lab of the indirect rule system in, is, is the northern Nigerian protectorate. So one can argue here that British colonial rule, in fact, entrenched Hausa Fulani and to some extent Kanuri Muslim power structure. And that power structure is a continuous process? It's, a, it's, it's, very much, it's very much a continuous process to the extent that from a methodological point of view, we can no longer separate a, a timeless pre-colonial past. We have to think about the pre-colonial in, in a critical 19th century moment. We also have to now see it in the context of its consolida consolidation under British colonial, colonial rule in the first half of the 20th century. In post-colonial Nigeria, either through military rule or civilian administrations of one kind or another, since 1960, that process has also continued. But it's also very important to recognize that that process is a larger part of an elite, an elite uh, um, alliance with southern Nigerian Christians. Professor In, Vaughan, let's look at yeah. this. What are the content of the process? If we say there is Islamization, what is the content of Islamization? What is that content of Fulanization? How do I identify it? Well, I mean, I, I, as I said, I am, I am always, I have reservations about, about slogans. I am not quite convinced that I am ready to embrace the notion of fulanization. I would rather want to focus attention on the ways in which history reverberates in the present. I would like us to think more about the ways in which people deploy and utilize historical uh, forces to consolidate their power and their influence in the present. So, um, so in large measure... If you look at most of the Emirates of Northern Nigeria, these are really Hausa Fulani Emirates, although we tend to refer to them as Fulani Emirates. There's been so much intermarriage between so many different ethnic groups in Northern Nigeria, particularly Hausa and Fulani. That power structure is now fully entrenched in Northern Nigeria, and its influence in, in, in Central Nigeria is also quite apparent. But I think it's also very important for us to take seriously that elite consolidation and elite consensus is essentially what governs Nigeria. I, want, I don't want us really to, to embrace President Obasanjo with all due respect to the president's notion of fulanization or even General Danjuma's notion of fulanization. I think it's always very important for us to hold our leaders responsible after, even after the fact you see, at the end of even the, after the fact, even after the fact, because by and large, most of our leaders have been part of a process. They've been a part of a process of a political consensus, a political consensus, and an ethno regional, ethno religious consensus. Let's between, go into your book between Muslim rulers and also people who are, who are Christians it, from different parts of of the country. There is a book I would recommend to you. It is entitled Religion and the Making of Nigeria by Olufemi Van. Olufemi Van is our friend, Sergeant Lee Mary Amsley, Professor of American and African Diaspora Studies, Amherst College, Amherst, in the United States of America. In this book, Religion and the Making of Nigeria, Professor Vaughan is of the view that the Sokoto Jihad of 1804-1808 transformed the Hausa city-states, but also shaped the geopolitics of their neighbors to the south. And he's arguing that the present conflict on the Nigerian state takes a pattern 
And that pattern we can see when we consider Muslims and Christian structures that make up the foundation upon which the Nigerian colonial state was built. It's a book I want you to read. Because the time has come to find the solution. And I'm beginning to see the solution in books written by scholars like Olufemi Vaughan. How has religion shaped the configuration of power in Nigeria? Oh, thanks very much for that question, and thanks for your compliment for, to the book. Um, in, in trying to answer this important question, I should uh, perhaps give you a sense of how I came about writing this book, because that story itself will provide you a better insight to the important question that you posed. So um, at the beginning of the Fourth Republic, we, I'm sure Nigerians are forgotten right now, what welcomed the Fourth Republic, the current civil democratic dispensation that we're experiencing in Nigeria in 1999, was a horrible bloodletting in the early 2000s. We should not never forget. It came out of the Sharia crisis of 2000, 2001, 2002. It was thoroughly savage, brutal, and horrific. By and large, and we need to remember this, a lot of young Nigerians need to be aware of this. By and large, Islamic law, Sharia, was imposed on 12 majority Muslim northern Nigerian states. The question of the influence of Sharia as personal law in northern Nigeria has been well established from pre-colonial times. However, this time around, Sharia would govern not just, simple, not just simply personal uh, law, such as inheritance, marriages, and so on, but also civil and military, and civil and, and um, criminal law. So in effect, the imposition of Sharia will have in Nigeria two fundamental distinctive types of law in one country. One can argue from that point of view, Nigeria is no longer just one united country. And that's a contradiction. That is a fundamental contradiction. Contradiction. You cannot have two laws in one country, in my view, governing civil and criminal matters. Nigeria, as you very well know, as a British, a former British colony, operates under the common law system. Now. Minorities in northern and central Nigeria, rightly so, rebelled precisely because now Islamic law will have to govern their lives in total, every single aspect of their lives. And there are, I should mention, many Muslims who do not want to be governed by Islamic law in criminal matters. So this, this crisis in the early 2000s is really very important for us to understand. By virtue of the extent of that crisis and the carnage that arose, this was General Obasanjo's first term, President Obasanjo's first term as civilian governor. Let's as a civilian, as a, sorry, as civilian president of Nigeria. Yeah. So in that, in that context, I felt a need to excavate the reason why. And in the process of trying to excavate the reason why this carnage happened over a three, four year period, uh, I realized that I have to engage in a long historical analysis of the problem. And what did you arrive at? I arrived at that first and foremost, militant, Radical Islamist movements have been happening in northern Nigeria for quite some time, starting even in the, in the uh, colonial period, at the beginning of the colonial period. In the 1980s, uh, some of us might still remember Mai Tai Tsini, which is also an, uh, another radical Islamist movement in northern Nigeria. Of course, we're well aware of Boko Haram. Boko Haram, one can argue, came out of this crisis of Sharia in, the, in, in essentially 2005, 2006-ish, 
that will be the, 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 the time frame. So, so this sporadic tendencies of Islamic uh, militancy and insurgency uh, as part of the northern central Nigerian landscape needs serious um, analytical uh, engagement. Now let's read from your book. I want to read from page 207. Are you there? Let's listen to this. I will read about two paragraphs from the book. It tells a story. And it's about Sharia. Professor Vaughan says, as the Sharia crisis intensified from 2000 to 2002, Obasanjo's federal government cultivated leaders of thought across the country, especially former government leaders, emirs, ulamas, and Christian leaders for religious reconciliation and national integration. Obasanjo conveyed the National Council of State the advisory board composed of current and former heads of federal governments, three branches, to define a clear pathway for our resolution to the Sharia crisis. Professor Vaughan continues in his book, saying, as an initial response to the crisis, the federal government evoking the support of the National Council of States called on the pro-Sharia northern states to suspend the implementation of their Sharia policies. Now, this is a line I want you to follow closely. The professor continues in his book, former President Sheu Shagari and Muhammadu Buhari, both Aousa Fulani Muslims, despite frustrations with the religious riots in northern states, denounced the federal government's interference in the affairs of 12 northern states. A much more confident Obasanjo would take things in stride in a national broadcast. After Shagari and Buhari's announcement, he reassured the nation, yes, Obasanjo now, I must not end this brief address without assuring all fellow citizens of the firm determination of our government to resist any attempt from any quarters to pursue a line that can lead to the disintegration of this country. Those who break our laws will be punished to the full extent of the law. There will be no sacred cows, and those that extend the hand of fellowship to their fellow citizens will find understanding and friendship. That's a passenger there. Nevertheless, the Zamfara state government questioned the legitimacy of the federal government to interfere in its affairs. This was followed by the Kano state governor's insistence that the federal government had no constitutional authority to intervene, to interfere rather, in his state's Sharia policy. I just finished reading from page 207 of Olufemi Vaughan's book entitled Religion and the Making of Nigeria. The role that Buhari played there. Tell me more. <laughs> well, I mean... He I, was not president then. He wasn't. He wasn't. Um, I, I think what you read is quite ex very clear. I mean... President Buhari um, supported the pro-Sharia movement at the time, um, but so did most northern Nigerian Muslim leaders. So I think it's really very important to recognize that uh, President Buhari's position on Sharia was not unusual. It was really the popular position of most northern Nigerian power elite. So why has he not implemented Sharia as a president now? I mean, Sharia is an operation still. Is that why they say he wants to fulanize the country? Because his argument in the past has come to hurt him. Well, again, I mean, as I had mentioned, uh, Edmund, Brother Edmund, as I mentioned, um, I am always apprehensive about terms and slogans. But Buhari has always loved Sharia. And in your book, it is clearly represented. He opposed Obasanjo 
for trying to come at Sharia at the time. He, he, he did. But as I argued in the book, what is more important, and I think this is really very significant, what is more important is not so much the embrace of Sharia. What is important is the context in which Sharia became popular in northern Nigeria. And what I want to encourage you to uh, and your audience to think about is the context of the popularity of Sharia. Sharia was not just simply popular by major northern Nigerian Muslim leaders. Um, not just simply emirs or ulamas, Muslim clerics, but also young, well-educated people. Was Sharia a mystic at the time it came during Obasanjo's time? Shari I mean, clearly it, it, it was. But what is important is we need to pose the question. I want to encourage you. Um, you're the one interviewing. It's your program. I want to encourage us to think about why Sharia itself? Why, why, why is it that that expanded Sharia became so pervasive and so popular in northern Nigeria. So why? The reason is a very simple one, and it's one that I made in the book. Context matters. By and large, the moral authority and the legitimacy of the Nigerian, the formal structures of the Nigerian state has eroded significantly. Uh, the basic assumption is that common law as failed northern Nigerians. Remember, this is really the world of neoliberal, neoliberal politics and economics. At the, you know, when, when most Nigerians, northern, southern Nigerians, were really in dire straits, conditions were extremely challenging for many, many Nigerians. So now, if the prevailing political legal system is failing Nigerian en masse, People are now reverting to say, okay, why can't we have Islamic law as an alternative to a failed Nigerian state, which is under common law? So I think that context matters a great deal. And now we have seen the consequences right. of such law. Absolutely. By the way, I think it's very important to state categorically that in of itself, expanded Sharia in a country like Nigeria cannot work. It is a recipe for disaster. No, that brings me... And it has failed miserably. To what over, is going on it, presently. It has failed miserably. There's no question about that. The bandits will not succeed. Uh, absolutely, it has failed. But it will lead to blood if it's not controlled. It, it, actually, blood the, the fact of the matter is, and it's already led to, to bloodletting. Remember what I said initially, that what the, the very moment the 12 predominantly northern Muslim states, Hausa, Fulani, and Kanuri, imposed Sharia, people rebelled. People rebelled, and literally hundreds of people were killed. Uh, so I think it's really, it's not just simply the fact that, uh, that violence will happen in, in, you know, in, in, in our contemporary moment. The violence is already there. I'd mentioned earlier that Boko Haram, Boko Haram is in fact an, out an offshoot, an outcome of the Sharia crisis. No, you, you, you give me a term. If you see what I mean. Yes. So, so people need to see the, the leaders of Boko Haram wanted an Islamic state. And when they realized that that was not going to happen as a consequence of the failure of Sharia, very quickly, no. that led to the radicalism that, that eventually, uh, you know, uh, Provided Boko Haram. You have talked of expanded Sharia. Yes. And that sounds like what is called Islamization. True or false? Yeah, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Who are those behind this expanded Sharia? Uh, well, the people who are behind it, uh, they're essentially the, the northern Nigerian Muslim political class. The political class? Absolutely. And, but they've also succeeded in mobilizing the large majority of ordinary Muslims in northern Nigeria. Let's look at the resistance of the South. Mm -hmm. What will happen? Will the South allow it from your research? What do you see? Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no evidence to suggest, and this may sound a bit too optimistic, there's no evidence to suggest that northern Nigerian rulers are intending to impose Sharia in southern Nigeria. There's just no evidence to, to confirm that. Is there evidence that criminal bandits wants to impose Sharia? 
in in southern anywhere Africa. in Nigeria. Because if you listen to your boss and Joe's Sharia, talk, Sharia is already Sharia is already imposed in in northern in Muslim majority states in northern Nigeria. I'm talking about central Nigeria now, the and, middle and, belt. And, oh, it's it's contested fiercely in central Nigeria in the middle belt. But there's a there's always been a desire. There's always been a desire, and this is really very important, and this is why history matters a great deal. There's always a desire to see central Nigeria, the, what we call the geopolitical region of central Nigeria, what we call the Middle Belt, as a frontier of Hausa Fulani, uh, you know, region of Nigeria. So there's a particular kind of a frontier mentality. And if there's a frontier mentality, it means invariably this is a place where we can project our power, a place where we can pro project our religion, our way of life. But it's also very important to mention that ethnic minorities, most of them Christians, have always resisted this. And that resistance has always led to, obviously, violence of one type or another. Before we go, what should Buhari be doing now? Well, uh, what we haven't spoken about, which I think is really very important, I'd predicted, and I thought at the time, um, I hoped at the time that I would be wrong, five years ago, when uh, this crisis of the herder, uh, Fulani herders started, just five years ago, I predicted that this will make Boko Haram look like child's play. I am sorry that that prediction is actually beginning to happen. You know, there are times when you will predict something and you don't want it to happen. That was five years ago. The herders crisis started five years ago, and it has consumed the entire country. But the herder crisis has always been there in history. Well, well the, the, it, it, it's always been a problem. <laughs> But it's now a national crisis. I think there's a distinction between between serious problems and a national crisis. So what should what should President Buhari do? I am not. It's beyond my pay grade to advise President Buhari about what he should or should not do. But if President Buhari is listening to me, I don't think he is. I would suggest immediately that the current administration must constitute a national, with immediate effect, a national commission of inquiry that must include major leaders of thought with extreme distinction from all parts of the country. Environmentalist, ecologist, econom economist, historians and political scientists of high rep repute. Because this is a serious, serious crisis and give us the best ideas, the best understanding, the best perspective of the enormity of this crisis consuming our country. There's too much noise and clutter on the airwaves, on the internet. You know how it is with Nigerians. You encourage young Nigerians to read to do good quality research before they open their mouths and make categorical authoritative statements. There's just so much author authoritative statements out there that have no basis in evidence or serious research whatsoever. We need to know the nature of this crisis consuming now. No time There's to waste. There's no time to waste. Because you see, the front line of this crisis is multiple. Unlike Boko Haram, the front line of Boko Haram is limited. The front, we've never seen anything like this before in Nigeria. It cannot be contained. Precisely because it is actually everywhere. Right? Its dimensions are multi, they're multidimensional. They're multiple. And it's extremely difficult to contain. It's also very important to mention that oftentimes what we call Fulani or Fulanization or Islamization have different context. It's really very, you know, it cannot just simply mean one thing. So we need to study this very quickly and very carefully and come up with serious recommendations. What about Buhari to, refused to act? 
gosh, I don't even want to, to imagine what might happen. Because what might, what, what is, what might happen is already happening. <laughs> and and I, would, I would mention this, that the, the space where this thing will lead to major clashes is southern Nigeria. <laughs> There's no fulanization and Islamization in, in southern Nigeria. It will not happen. I can, I can assure you. And the reason why it will not happen is precisely because the texture of southern Nigeria just simply will not allow that to happen. Let's leave it at that. Southwestern Nigerian, southwestern Ni Yoruba Muslims are Yoruba first and Muslim second. I think it's really very important. You, the Yoruba region is the Muslim Christian crossroads, not to talk about Yoruba cosmology. And it will not views. work. It will not work. It will not succeed. It will not succeed. It will be a complete failure Professor in Dr. southern Dr. Nigeria. Thank you for because people on state will affairs. resist, and when people resist, the conditions are going to be quite bad for the country. Professor Lufemi Vaughan is the author of the book Religion and the Making of Nigeria. Wow. Alfred Sergeant Lee Mary Amsley, Professor of American and African Diaspora Studies. Of African. Um, and okay, of African. And African Diaspora. Okay, studies. African and African. <laughs> Why African and African? African Diaspora. Yeah. Okay, of yeah. African and, and African, African diaspora. diaspora Studies. Good. I would say that Professor Vaughan is one of Nigeria's gift to the rest of the world. But somehow, we don't know how to use the treasures that we've got. We let the world take them. We remain poor. Somehow, we have to make things right. Remember that everything good will come. There will be no war. There will be peace. And President Buhari will act. I am Edmond Dobilo. Thank you for listening to Professor Vaughan.